On this episode of Realtor 180, I sit down with Dan Lesniak. He's a team leader, author, speaker, and coach. He's also a seven-time Ironman competitor, marathon runner, and father of four. I don't know how he does it. On this episode, we're going to do a deep dive as to how to build a real estate team from the ground up and the pitfalls to avoid along the way. Stay tuned because at the end, we're going to have a very special giveaway. Dan, what's happening? How's it going, Sean? Thank you for having me on today. Yeah, man, of course. Thanks for carving out some time. I know you have, oh my goodness, a handful of businesses that you're running simultaneously. So thanks for carving out the moment to chat with us. No problem. Um, I'm glad to, glad to be on here. I've done a deep dive on you on social media. I love how candid you are with all the conversations and things that you share about your business. Um, high level, how many businesses do you have? A lot. So we have our, our main real estate team in Washington, D.C. that covers you know, the entire DMV area. And we in t- 2021, we sold close to 11 homes. We have a development company that has over 100 condos we're building and we have over a hundred investors in that business that, that have partnered with us. We have our coaching business at Hyperfast Agent, uh, a short-term rental portfolio. You know, we, we do uh, a little bit of Airbnbs that have done pretty well. So we've got a lot and we've got four kids as well. So we're busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I like how you humbly glazed over this. You're a marathon runner. And a seven-time Ironman competitor, which is like those are careers unto themselves. Like that's that's a huge, that's a very very full plate. So I love when agents are like, "Oh, I'm so busy. I had like an appointment today." Yeah, um, I, I think, I and I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm going to correct you, but in the DMV, you said you closed almost eleven homes. I know that's like. Super oh, 1100, 1100. I knew it was a huge number. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. It, and that's actually what I want to unpack because I know it was such a staggering number. Um, and I just want that to sink into our listeners, 1100 homes. That's a huge, huge number. So obviously you didn't do that all as a one person show. No. You not. built a team. So yes. take us through that. Let's actually, we'll start at the beginning and not at the end, but how did you start? Day one, you made the decision, I want to grow this thing. How did you approach hi- making your first hire for this thing? I made my first hire at the end of my first year in the business. So I got my license in 2011. I thought it would be like a part-time gig or, you know, I didn't think it would be full-time. Uh, and then I got really, really busy. And one day I looked up and I had more commission in my like 60 to 90 day pipeline than my job was going to pay for the year. So I quit. I did it full time. I sold a little over 22 million year one and that was by myself. And then, you know, I read, I read a couple books, listened to some, uh, like training and, and, you know, that kind of thing and realized you have to hire people. So I made my my first hire at the end of my first year was uh, my assistant, or, or he became, you know, like a, an assistant. A lot of people go out and hire a buyer's agent. So I generally think that's the wrong approach um, because you need, to, you need to take care of the admin side of things first. Uh, you know, generally as real estate agents, we're good at sales. So adding someone else that's good at sales before you have back-end support typically doesn't make sense. Unfortunately, most real estate agents go that way because... They like the idea of not having to pay a salary, but if you're making 200 grand gross commission income, you typically can afford an assistant because then they're going to help you get to three or 400 or 500. And then you, you know, you build out that infrastructure and, and you build a team. Now, what really accelerated my team growing uh, was at, at the end of my first year, my, I started a title company with one of my clients who was an attorney and the broker at my office did not, the broker owner didn't like that. And, um, you know, he actually told me it was illegal, which it's not, uh, <laughs> and gave me, uh, an ultimatum. 
So um, you said, you know, you either have to quit the title company or quit the company. So I, I changed brokerages and I brought, uh, I had a partner, another agent who partnered with me in it. And so he, he came as well and we, we started to build out a team. And, um, you know, we went from like one assistant to an assistant plus a marketing coordinator and then an inside sales agent. And then we added three or four buyers agents that, that first year. So that was, that was kind of the origins of it. And then along the way at the new brokerage, I actually met my now wife, Carrie Scholl. And we, we basically had the number one and two teams in that office. Eventually started dating, then got married. And then we, we merged our teams, combined our teams. And that's the short version of it. And, um, you know, every year after that, we just kept learning, growing, adding, you know, um, some, some, some years you would, you know, have a big jump up other years, you might stay at the same or maybe even decline a little in transactions, which is okay. You know, sometimes you have to kind of like stabilize, build out the operations side more. So it's, it's not always this, you know, hockey stick up there. There definitely is that, but then there's like peaks and valleys within that. And, you know, you just have to always, always move forward and, and figure out how you can get better and improve things and, and, you know, when you're building out a team, you really need to focus too, I think, on how are you going to add value to the team members and then how are you going to help them add value to the clients? If you, if you come into it with the mindset of you're, you're building the team so that you don't have to do anything, it's going to be, you're going to go through some rough patches, I think, because the, the team does give you more control of your time, but you know, you, you kind of move more into this business operator mode instead of doing showings at all ends and hours of the day. So it, it shifts your work, but it doesn't completely eliminate it. If that makes sense. A hundred percent. I actually, you've left so many clues within all of what you've shared. Um, I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit. I, I completely agree with you with regards to the trajectory of your business. And as you make hires and as your as team lead as your focus shifts and changes you do have to slow down to go fast and you have to make those little pivots and adjustments not failures but observations of what's working what's not working so i completely agree my first hire similar to you i did not hire or bring on a partner or an agent i brought on an actual salaried operations person to run the back end of my business and for the first three, four months, my sales flattened out completely. But by the end of that year, I had doubled sales. So it's it's interesting that you shared that piece. Like you have to kind of, it's like, what are you measuring against them? Are you just measuring your short term or is it your long term? And then how those pieces all fit together. Um, would you say the biggest mistake just observationally that agents would then make is to bring on a non-salaried person, i.e. they bring on another agent to run parallel with them versus yeah. making a strategic hire. Most people start off that way, unfortunately. Again, they don't they don't want to pay the overhead. And they and when you do that, now now you're the admin for yourself and that agent that you brought on. So it's probably in most cases will actually cost you money you know you'll probably have this situation where your your team volume goes up but it doesn't go up the same way it could have had you freed yourself of the administrative time and um you know i think the way to look at it is when you go out and make a new hire as an we'll call it your first hire your your personal assistant admin you know they're gonna, they're gonna have to be flexible and kind of do a little bit of everything but when you make that first hire, it's going to take two, three or four months for you to kind of typically realize the benefit of it, right? Because you have to spend money on them up front and then you have to train them up on what to do. So you're putting time and money into this person in the hopes that once you get through that first 30, 60 days, they will then allow you to have more time, which will increase your business. So there's a like 90 if you do it right, you're going to get the payback, but it's going to take 90 days. 
Unfortunately, most real estate agents are only focused on 30 days in. You see the same thing with leads, right? When they, when they get For internet sure. leads come in or if they're ready to buy today, the agent can handle it. If it's someone that has to be followed up with for a year before they're going to buy, they typically lose out on that. Unfortunately, 90% of the leads that come in are 30 days and out. So agents think that the marketing doesn't work when really it's just a follow-up problem. And so it's all about uh, delayed gratification and, and being willing to put in time and money into something now, knowing that the payback is going to be 10 X, but not for 90 days. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big. I, I same page with you. That's a big shortcoming I find with with salespeople in general is you have to look at what type of sales cycle is it. With real estate, it's a significant decision for most people, and so the follow up has to happen multiple times, and it's usually not till the seventh time until something transpires. And most people give up what on the second. Like I called them twice. They didn't, they didn't respond. And you're like, well, yeah, keep going, man. What are you doing? Yeah, no, I agree. I, I like to challenge people to see how many no's they can get because eventually you're, you know, you're going to, you're going to get the yes, but it, yeah, it takes seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 times sometimes. And, and I think that's really interesting that in this business with this type of sale, you don't actually hear no often. They usually ghost you they're aloof with their answers or it's a timing thing. It's a conditional thing. They have to save for their down payment or they have to strategically do something before they do this next move. And so it's not actually a no, but I think some agents get, they don't know how to handle that and they, they give up and, and I, yeah, it's like, if you just have a system and follow up, that's, that's where your money's ultimately going to be made for sure. Um, and to go back with what you were sharing regarding hiring in agents, two agents coming together, you're right. They'll double their book of business overnight, but if they don't have the infrastructure, that's short lived. And I, I, in addition to it's not, you can't multiply it because as soon as you add a third component to it, it starts falling apart because to your point, you're the admin, like you're now doing all this other work plus sales plus it's you're not changing your job title, you're adding to your job title, which is that's a huge mistake. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um yeah, you, you see it all the time. And or or the other thing you'll see is they, they do hire their admin, but they wait too long. And so now they're in a situation where they're really, really busy and they need it. So they lower they lower their standards, right? And they, they probably take someone who's less qualified. And then, oh, they're busy, so they don't put the time in the training them. So that person quits or, you know, gets fired pretty soon. And, and then they say, like, oh, it doesn't work. Well, no, it does work. You just didn't put the time and training into this person. And you, you probably compromised on who you should have hired, you know. And most of the time, a lot of the stuff we do doesn't work on the first time. Anyway, like my, my first assistant didn't didn't work out, not because of him, because of me. And, you know, that took me 60 days to learn that lesson, but then it, it ended up being a better situation. He actually went on to have a great career in real estate and, you know, I, I figured it out the second time. So just because your first hire doesn't work out, doesn't mean that overall it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. And, and within that, I think one distinction and i'm not sure if people caught this is you took ownership of it and that's that's huge of not playing blame the blame game and pointing fingers but just acknowledging like i could have done this better and i'll do this the next time around that's how we learn instead of oh it was their fault they didn't execute on this they didn't learn fast enough they didn't xyz um yeah i think we all you get experiences from making mistakes and so if you're not out there actually trying stuff, you're going to not learn as quick. In terms of your structure, let's say an agent starting listening to this and they want to build a team. So we'll do the, the dance structure of building a team. So there's you, you build up enough base of revenue or pipeline, and then you hire an admin to support you on the back end. Who's your next hire after that? An inside sales agent. So someone that can book you more appointments. So 
I think. I think the average agent can handle two to three deals a month before they go crazy. The admin hopefully adds one or two more to that um, capability, right? So that puts you at four or five maybe. And then the inside sales agent, you know, maybe gets you another one or two. And this person is someone that you, you structure the base salary, like in the 24 to 36 K range, depending on the area. And then you give them a percentage of the deals that they book. And again, this is something it's going to take them a month or two of training and then they have to start booking appointments. And then when you get that appointment, um, it's it going to take you two, three, four months to close it. So this is one of those deals where you're, you're investing money and time up front and but a big payback is coming later because if you think about that base salary range, I mentioned, you know, in most markets, it's two deals a year that they have to generate to kind of cover that base. So in reality, you should make five, six, seven, eight X off this investment. And then once you do that, now you're going to get an, an overflow of leads and you have the support system in place. So now you go out and you get a buyer's agent. That's the the process that, that I would recommend for most people. I'm on the same page with you. And again, like not to go back and pick apart your words. I really like that. You said the word investment instead of employee or, right. in, or you're just using a different language for that because it is an investment and as an investment you want to see an ROI and in this business they're significant if you're closing homes especially at the higher price ranges they it compounds very very quickly and then you start getting referrals off of that with this uh, inside salesperson where are they generating from it can be all different sources on our team we you know we we do a lot of marketing and lead generation so we we typically start them with people that are warm that have raised their hand in some fashion that said i'm interested in learning more about buying or selling but we've also added expired withdrawns our database as well you know past clients and then uh we do geo we we call it geo circle prospecting or geo targeting where they'll they'll call a neighborhood when there's an open house that we're doing that week. And so it can be a mix of warm and cold leads or, or less warm leads. So based on your structure for the inside salesperson and then your ratio, let's say you've built out the team optimally, how many agents per one inside salesperson? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, on our team, typically one inside sales agent can book 10 appointments a week. And we like to we like to give our agents at least one appointment a week. So, but but more when we can. And so we we try to be above that. So I think one one inside sales agent can support five agents, and probably at that level, give them two appointments a week. Okay, and then who's after that? So you have your principal agent, your operations person, your inside person, and now you have an additional agent who's, what do you do? What's your next strategic? You'd move? probably hire what we call a partner agent or a listing agent. So this would be someone that would work more closely with you than a buyer's agent. You might have them on a salary plus bonus structure. And you know, you're going to be trying to drive your, high value listings, high value, like repeat buyer clients to them to free up more of your time because you're going to have to start to get in a manager role, right? So you still want to interact with the clients. You still want to drive leads, uh, but then you want to hand them off to someone that you that's worked closely with you that you've trained that's on a salary plus bonus structure. That's going to drive up the percentage that you're able to uh, keep and then free your time to start being a manager and trainer of the agents. 
at a certain point, I think when you get to around 10 agents, um, maybe more for some, you're probably going to have to look at hiring a sales manager, someone to, to help manage and train the agents, you know, onboard new ones and, you know, manage the current ones. Uh, and I think that typically will happen at 10 or more agents somewhere in that range. So many good nuggets there. I, I, <laughs> I, I want to be sitting here with a, uh, just drawing out the map. I love that you've actually given the numbers of basically when this happens, you can then make this next strategic move. So people can literally use this as a roadmap. Um, so once you get to that point, do you then duplicate this and move to another market? Or what's your next line of growth at that point? Which is at, at that point, you're doing a significant amount of volume daily. It's You have a lot of activities happening. Probably 20 to 30 deals a month at this point. Uh, you could, you could go into another market that, you know, some people have done that or, or you can just keep building where you are. You're going to have to, you know, eventually you're going to have to get managers for your inside sales team, right? You're going to have to get a manager for your marketing team. You'll probably have to hire an HR slash recruiting person and then think about like a chief operating officer. So you're, you're kind of moving from you've, you've built out all the departments you're putting in department heads or managers. And then now you have to start thinking like C level type people, um, you know, people that can lead groups of five to 10, uh, or more. Um, you know, once you do that, yeah, you could do the expansion model and have, you know, your core team is kind of the hub and then you, you build off different spokes and, and, you know, find partners in, in other markets. I think there's been, there's, there's definitely some examples of people that have done that nationwide and, and gotten into to multiple markets. Um, you know, it just, I, I think there's a lot of challenges with that too. You know, it depends on, like some at some places where you're at, you you have to pay, you know, a market cap to one franchise owner in this state, and then when you move to another one, another. So there's there's all sorts of decisions and things to make at that point. But once once you're at that level where you have two or three or four good leaders, I think I think you your options expand. You know, you can you can look at different markets. I think people. In general, though, people probably do it too soon before they've built out, um, you know, the core. So I think I think there's a, we all get that uh, shiny object sh syndrome where we oh god, it's the, we see something that else is the we, worst. We, yeah, we we move away um, when we needed to stay for just a little bit longer. <laughs> for sure, that's a great point. Is the shiny object. And it's, you have two budgets, you have the financial and then you have your time and trying to weigh and balance, do I have the time to do this? And do we have the financial means to sustain doing this new, this new project over time? Do you think at that level, which is a pretty high level at that moment, that's your biggest challenge is just the distractions of having a business that large or are there other components that start weighing in? No, I, I think it's a it's a really challenging problem is is how to how to avoid the the dangers of the distractions and to to not move into other things. And if you do move into other things, you really need to make sure you have good partners in those areas or those other uh, lines that you're you're moving into. And you know you're probably you're probably going to be best um, utilized if you can expand in a way that takes advantage of what you're good at and you have someone else that's filling the gaps of the things you're not good at or don't want to do. For most real estate agents at this level, you're probably good at the marketing and the lead generation side of things. So when you do expand, you want to make sure that you're able to focus on what you're good at and you've got good partners in 
the original business you built and good partners in the new areas you're moving into. What's your filter before if somebody, if I came to you today and said, Hey, Dan, here's an amazing project. Here's a new concept, a new idea. How, what's your filter for deciding, is this a shiny object or is this really a viable direction we should go? Yeah, no, you, you need to look at the deal itself. The, the business is a, a good idea, but then you really, you really need to vet the operator make sure they've got a track record of success, make sure that they're, they're really successful in another area like that or, or that they're successful in what they're bringing to you because people, people with track records of success typically continue to have success. I agree. I, it's, it's really fascinating that you bring that up because I found that most people that I sit down and talk to like this are athletes in some capacity, either ballet dancers, fencers. I'm a martial artist. You're a marathon runner. I feel like there's a weird component that they bring to the table. Um, which I don't, I don't know what it is. And I, I would love to try to figure that out, but I think there's something about physical hard work that changes your brain and how you approach problems. And also if you're competing, you have to learn how to lose and figure out it doesn't define me. It's just something that's going to happen. Do you find a similar, similar parallel for yourself with training yeah and no i agree business. like when we're hiring um yeah we we count success and like if we're hiring a new agent we we definitely like we don't hold it against them that they don't have success in being an, an agent yet like if they have a proven track record in something else if they've done challenging things like you know if they've climbed mount everest i mean it's an extreme example I, I haven't met any agents that have done that yet but i don't think you know, i've if, met anybody who's done that <laughs> i'd like to yeah i met someone who was gonna do it and then the pandemic like threw a wrench in those plans but um yeah people that have a track record in other areas uh, especially if it's physical right like uh we we live a very comfortable life as 21st century Americans, right? Or people in the Western world. And if you, it's the, the, the ease of our comfort has accelerated very, very quickly. And if you look back just 200 years ago, you had to farm and like go kill your food <laughs> now. And then it, then it moved to like, okay, you can go to the grocery store. Now you just pick up your smartphone and Amazon delivers you food from your couch right or you go on uber and they deliver you cooked food so it's we live a very very comfortable life and it's getting harder to find people that have done things that might make you uncomfortable and you know marathons fitness challenges iron man's bike rides whatever it is right these endurance things um they're, I kind of look at them as a micro simulation of what everyday life used to be like a couple hundred years ago. So I think, I think the people that have been through it have a proven track record to handle discomfort. And certainly when you're trying to work with a buyer, trying to work with a seller, like discomfort is going to come up and the people that have sought out things to that will bring them discomfort and worked through it probably are a higher bet of success than the ones who haven't. I'm not saying that you have to go run a marathon before you can sell a house. I just think it, it certainly adds to the likelihood that you will succeed. You know, again, people that haven't been through these kind of things can certainly still succeed. It, it, I just think it's the ones that have done it are more likely. Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely, it shows character because you can't just, most people can't just get up, walk out the front door and run a marathon. It, it first obviously takes the decision to do it. And then it takes a training schedule. It typically requires a coach. And then you have to monitor your diet and when you're training, what you're eating, how often you're doing this thing. It's not, it's not an overnight success to to go and run a marathon, regardless of how you finish, 
it's all these micro wins and failures to get to that point. So I completely agree. I, my background, again, it's, it's martial arts and I, you don't need a black belt to sell a house. Right. The, the getting, I mean, getting kicked in the face. Yeah. That's gonna, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what it feels like. You hear enough right. nose. Yeah. Uh, or you have a blow up, uh, uh, like your biggest deal of the year just blow up. You're like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what it feels like. Um, uh, but it, you know, in training in any capacity, I feel that it just teaches you to to invest your time in the training and then the event, whatever that is, the competition, those results will just show up from your training. And so if you're a realtor and you're doing open houses, if you invest your time in doing really high quality open houses, the new buyers coming to meet you will they'll just come to fruition you'll start generating sales from that and it's it's i don't see a dissimilarity between the two um you obviously had a very like insanely huge year when you got into the business were you a marathon runner at that point or what was your secret sauce how did you build a pipeline that big that quick to get to that point that's a does those are big numbers you were putting up. No, I had run a, a few marathons prior to that, but you know, I actually, I actually, you know, I have I have a Navy background. Did did a couple tours on a submarine, then worked at the Pentagon. I got out as a defense contractor. Was getting my MBA at Georgetown while I was working at the Pentagon and in my contracting job after I had gotten out of the Navy. And I I always thought I would get this dream job for you know nba people always want to go work for like mckinsey bcg bain all these strategy consulting jobs and this was in 2011 they weren't really hiring a lot i did a lot of interviews but didn't get any offers and one of the interviewers told me that they thought i was good from a technical and problem solving point of view but they they questioned if i would be good at sales and that this job involved a lot of sales so I said, well, what should I do? He said, go get, go Here's get some the experience. Irony. <laughs> yeah. Go get some experience in something that's completely different that, and then apply in a year from now. So I, I was buying another home in Washington, DC, Arlington area, decided to get my real, real estate license. And I, I thought it would be like a family and friends or just used for myself kind of deal. But then that, this kind of happened and I thought, well, maybe I'll market to my building. And because I have this full-time contracting job, I don't want to go out and market to my SOI. Um, a, because I don't, I don't want my job necessarily to know I'm like trying to be a full-time realtor. And B, all of my friends, none of them know me as a realtor. So I'll just try to market to the 200 condos in the building I lived in. And it worked really, really well. All of a sudden, I started getting, you know, people trying to buy in the building, people trying to sell, then move to like, the townhouse community next next door and this kind of stuff so i was getting just a ton of business in one really 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 small area like i could walk to all my listings typically um but i mean i think all but one of my deals that year were were in like a half mile radius of, of where i lived and it yeah like i said earlier i i had enough deals within a few months to quit my job and I just kept on hammering this niche strategy and slowly expanded to adjacent buildings and and townhomes and some single families you know nearby. But it, it really started by having a narrow, narrow focus. So I, I like to think I just I came up with this genius strategy, but part of really a lot of it was just necessity of you know the the being at the job and wanting to just start small where I lived. So then I developed this, uh, this framework that I I'd kind of learned at business school called STP segmentation, targeting and positioning. So how do you break your market into different segments? Which segment are you going to target? And then how do you position yourself as someone that can add unique value to them? And I kind of took that approach with everything I did in regards to expansion. And then Later on, I wrote a book about it, the hyper local, hyper fast real estate agent, and 
I'd kind of like describe my overall framework in there, how I got each deal my first year, the you know how I work through issues and closing them, and that that book did really really well on on Amazon and other places we sold Barnes and Nobles, and um, that that kind of led to our coaching program, the Hyperfast Agent Coaching Program. So it um, yeah, I had no idea what I was getting into. I just knew I I wanted to uh, get good at sales so I could go reapply to some other jobs. And then I got good enough that I didn't think about applying there ever again. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you actually touched on a couple really, I think important things, um, which again, you, you, you pass over so casually, but I think there's really like golden nuggets in there is you had a niche and you didn't get distracted by shiny objects. You literally said all your deals were within a half mile. That's having a neat, like a hyper local niche without being distracted by, by all the other opportunities and noise and just deep diving. Um, and I also feel this is an important thing as well is when you're brand new and starting out, I had the same challenge is I worked previously for an affluent uh, athletic club. So I was connected to a lot of CEOs and C-suite executives. The problem was they didn't know me as a realtor. And so I couldn't go into this business brand new saying that I can sell these homes and do these things because I had no track record. So I didn't want to blow out my lead list that way. So similar to you is I went and met strangers who didn't know me. And so when I introduced myself as a realtor, they just only knew me then as a realtor. And that gave me a huge advantage because later, the next step for me, once I did have a, a book of business and I had this track record of performance, then I was able to go back to the first group who actually already knew me. And I was able to put up my numbers and say, I'm helping all these people. I'm helping these families. I've done this. And then that that first group then started trusting me to do sales. And that's how my personal business evolved. And so I, I think as a brand new agent listening to this, there's the way you did it, Dan, was very strategic and incredibly smart because you you just kept digging. The well was giving you water and you just kept going back to that well and digging it a little bit deeper, which is brilliant. Yeah. If, I mean, if, if it's, if it's working, do more of it, right? <laughs> it's really funny. I think, and I've done this and I've been guilty of it is you, you do this thing and you do it a lot. You continue to do it. It gets you really busy. You have money. So you invest in this other thing that you hope is going to get you more revenue. It winds up not. So then you stop doing this first thing, which is the science shiny object syndrome. You stop doing the first thing that was actually producing in the first place. And your business is tanking while you're trying the second thing. And it's like, just do what works. Yeah, no, I've, uh, I've been there. I know how it feels. So, <laughs> And it sounds like... It's a trap, usually, <laughs> if you don't do it the it right It totally way. is. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, maybe it's entrepreneurial ADD or I don't, I don't know what it is. We, we hope that next thing is going to be more enticing, better, exciting. We chase it and it's... That's not always the case. So similar to the first hire is this was the piece of advice that I heard is, is hire slow, fire fast, rather than just panic hire and, or panic decide and be like, oh my God, we have to do this right now and invest all this money in it. Um, what would you say in the early, let's say your first one to five years, what was like your biggest, your biggest, I'm going to frame it in a, in a nice way, but your biggest learning experience, like what was the biggest blunder you did? And you're like, Oh gosh, I wish, I wish I had a time machine to do that one over, but I learned something from it. I would say consistently the one thing is really, if you're going to bring in partners, you, you have to you have to really vet them. Like it's better, it's better to go slower, take more time studying, take more time up front on contracts and thinking about exit scenarios and, and really before you 
start partnerships or new ventures um, with with people. You know, really do your your homework up front and make sure they are going to bring as much to the table, you know, as you or or at least in proportion to how the agreement is structured as well. You know, we we've had one or two times where a partner let us down and you you spend so much emotional energy and time dealing with that that it you know, it's going to take away from the other things you're doing that are successful. So it would it would be to vet your partners hard, you know, really really hard. That sounds like a painful learning experience there. Um I agree. I mean, I I feel like and I've done it as myself is we we have these contracts that are positioned five pages of how everything's going to turn out amazing, but we only have like one sentence if it's going to go south. Whereas we should have an equal five pages of how are we going to divide this thing when it goes south because statistically there's there's a decent probability that it potentially will. And you see it all the time, especially with agents. And I think out of convenience is they'll just partner up and not really think about all the components of it. Yeah, you see that a lot, like top producers, you know, come together for this partnership. And then one of them's driving like 80% of the leads or, you know, you see things like that all the time. And you're like. You can kind of like see the, the, the train wreck happening in slow motion. Like I've, I've seen other examples out, outside of myself where two people partner up and then you start seeing like, wow, that person's doing like 80 to 90% of all the deals. Like how, how is this thing going to sustain? <laughs> um, well, it's your point earlier is you have two agents coming together, which if you just do the job description, they basically do the same thing. And it's like, okay, so now you have two of them. Who's going to do the stuff no one wants to do? <laughs> And and if you're both really amazing at selling, for example, then who's going to do the admin stuff? Like somebody, it's it's gotta it's gotta be traded somewhere. And to your point, I think people shiny object. We get so excited, we dive in, and we're like, oh shoot, we didn't actually think about this other thing. And until it's until it's like snowballed into all this other business and all these other things, um, that's a huge learning. And and I think it goes back to, you know, high or slow, fire or fast. It's like, take your time. Think about this stuff. It's not going to evaporate tomorrow if you don't decide on it today. You're fine. Um, with coaching, which I feel like we could sit down for another full hour and talk about just that segment, which I love that you got into that because it feels like you have a lot of great experiences to share. But with coaching, what's... when when agents are coming to you, what's, what are their big suite of problems that they're trying to overcome? We have a lot of online courses and things that are good for all agents, you know, new middle team leaders, uh, that those are all at hyperfastagent.com. But we, for our mastermind program that we have, we're really focused on agents that want to scale. So these are typically people doing as a solo agent, two to three deals a month, or maybe they have a small team and and they want to learn how to scale. And we want to kind of give them the path to get there. So for, for most of them, it's how do you do more deals, but while at the same time getting out of production and moving more into like a business owner slash operator. So that's that's the the typical agent that we are helping in our mastermind program. Like, how do you build out these systems, the teams, the accountability, all that stuff? Yeah, I love that you have all these training components, the books, obviously, and then the coaching piece. Um, that's actually a perfect way to wrap it up. I uh, listen. I want to do something really unique and special for our listeners. What I'll do is let's say 30 days after this airs, we'll run a promotion on social media. You'll have to look around, poke around, figure out where it is. Likely it'll be on Instagram, but I'm going to buy three copies of your book and we're going to give it to to three listeners. And so they'll just have to 
figure out how to figure that out. <laughs> It'll be in the description somewhere. Um, Dan, I certainly appreciate your time and you sharing so candidly how you developed and grew your business businesses. That's really incredible. And I feel like we've barely, barely, barely scratched on the surface of, of all of that you do. So thanks. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. This was a blast. I, I hope, uh, hope, hope the listeners got some value out of it and, and hope everyone has an amazing 2023. I think, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity out there for the agents that work hard and, and work on their, their sales skills, work on their business skills. I agree. I think there's going to be more opportunity in 2023 than there's been previously because the people who have strategically put the right things in place, there's going to be a significant amount of opportunities for them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, thanks again. Uh, I really appreciate being on the show today. And um, you know, if there's anything I can do to help you or your listeners ever, let me know. Sounds like a plan. Appreciate it.